So what makes for a real Thanksgiving to you? Do you have to have a turkey and maybe some green bean casserole? Is it a pumpkin pie or pecan pie or sweet potato pie? What is it that makes it real to you? It's interesting. All of it you said. <laughs> Thank you, Eddie. I'm getting response from behind me. I know here in the South we like our turkey. Sometimes people add a ham. I, I know I've been to several places where they're actually frying turkeys now. It's an interesting experience there as well. If you go up a little bit north of us to Maryland, you might find sauerkraut on the menu because there's a great German-American influence there. You go on up to New York, you might find manicotti. That's different, isn't it? But I like manicotti. I'll be okay with that. Up in New England, there's oyster stuffing. There's creamed onions and something called hasty pudding. Haven't had that one, but it might be good. In the Midwest, they love casseroles and wild rice. In Texas, you might have tamales and something called frog-eyed salad. Did you eat that, Melissa? No. <laughs> She's seen it, though, when she was in Texas. <laughs> Melissa says she doesn't eat it because it's a salad. <laughs> you go all the way out to the West Coast in California, sometimes they have fresh crabs. It's in season and sourdough dressing. And if you go all the way down to Florida, you might actually get a key lime pie at Thanksgiving. I may have just made everybody a little hungry, but isn't it interesting how we associate Thanksgiving with food? Different foods, of course. We teach our children this from the time they're young. If you get to come over to our preschool this week, they have their annual Thanksgiving feast. It's not turkey and dressing. It's chicken nuggets and corn. <laughs> but this year we're adding tater tots, I believe, to the menu. It's going to be a big deal at our preschool this year. Thanksgiving, however, is not actually about the food. Most of us know the story that the pilgrims came in 1620 on the Mayflower. They came with 102 passengers, and as they came over, it was a treacherous journey. Many of them were religious separatists. They wanted to come where they could practice their religions freely. It was a treacherous crossing. The Mayflower actually was not a passenger ship. It was a cargo ship. So the people were down in the cargo holds. It was cold. They were hungry. The ship rolled, as one described it, as a pig rolling back and forth. It doesn't sound very pleasant, does it? Illness was rampant. And when they got to America in the winter... They faced starvation. They faced many more illnesses. If it had not been for the Native Americans who came along to help and to show them how to grow corn and how to harvest sap and how to catch fish, many more would have died. And so on that first Thanksgiving, when the harvest came in, they declared a day of Thanksgiving. And that's how it all started. What about us? How grateful are we? Sometimes it takes difficulties, it takes losing something for us to actually see how grateful we should be. Sometimes we might go through an illness and when we come through that, we are grateful for life once again. Sometimes we might go through a time where we're feeling down and when we receive that joy again, we understand what it's like to experience that gratitude to God. As we think about this story that we find in Scripture this morning, we find ten lepers. We find ten people who have a disease that is literally eating their body away. They have banded together for survival. In fact, they have even crossed some boundaries that just weren't crossed in those days. The Jews and one Samaritan were together. They came together because it was a hard time for them all. It can be a hard time for us sometimes. And sometimes those hardships can bring us together. Do you remember after 9-11 how our country came together at least for a short time and felt united? Sometimes it takes those kind of things. I remember talking to my uh, pastor who I had when I was in college, Dr. Altus Newell, and I was asking him a little bit about his ministry that happened before he got there. And we're talking about how churches can unite or how churches can be divisive. And I asked him one time, I said, Dr. Newell, uh, what's the most united you've ever seen a church? And he said, that's easy. When I was pastor at St. Matthew's Baptist Church in Louisville, Kentucky, the sanctuary burned. 
He said, such a tragedy. But it brought our church together like never before. All of a sudden, all those things that seemed significant seemed insignificant. And we came together with the task of rebuilding not only the sanctuary, but rebuilding the church. What about you? Does it take a tragedy to make you see the blessings of life? When I was in seminary, there was a woman whose name is Ann Pierce. Ann was not just a friend. She was kind of like the seminary mom. <laughs> she had come to seminary later in life. She was a nurse, and her husband had tragically died. And in the midst of that grief that she was going through, she decided that she wanted to help others in a new way. Though she had been helping others as a nurse, she wanted to come and get theological training so that she might be able to share more of Christ there in her work because she was kind of this mom figure. She gathered some of us who were still single and she said, y'all all come up to my apartment on Thanksgiving and I'll cook you a Thanksgiving meal. I still remember that meal. I remember how much love she had, how much she wanted to help others. She took one of the most difficult situations in life and she turned it into an opportunity to serve. Jesus, when he saw people in pain, always reached out. In Matthew 9, 36, he sees the crowds, and it says that he had compassion on them, for they were like sheep without a shepherd. You remember when Jesus came after Lazarus had passed? He came and he wept bitterly, tears of grief. You see, sometimes we have to know the difficulties of life before we can really appreciate the joys of life. What about the pains that we have in our lives? How will we use those? Will we use those for the better? Will we become more empathetic with others? You know, it's been such a difficult time as we are still battling COVID in this country, though we all would like for it to be over. We have a choice. Do we gripe and do we complain? Or are we grateful? For the things that we do have, for the opportunities that are before us. I remember some years ago when I was first getting into midlife. I still like to think I'm in midlife, but I'm getting a little older. <laughs> but I went to the doctor and got a checkup, and he said, How are things going, Nelson? And I said, Well, actually, he said, I said to him, I'm not feeling as good as I used to. I, don't hike quite as easily. I get a little tired and, and I have these aches and pains that are hurting me. And what should I do about that? And I'll never forget. He looked right at me and said, you should be grateful for what you had when you had it. <laughs> oh, well, what kind of advice is that? <laughs> be grateful for what I had when I had it. We can be like that in any stage of our life. We can choose to look at what we don't have, or we can be grateful for what God has blessed us with and what God will bless us with in the future. You see, God's grace can lead us to thankfulness, or we can be forgetful. It's kind of up to us, isn't it? The story of these 10 lepers is a significant story. Jesus sees them. They're far off and they cry, have mercy on us. And Jesus says, go show yourself to the priest. And as they are going, they are all healed. Nine keep on the way. Of course, they're following Jesus' instructions. Go show yourself to the priest, right? But one is so overwhelmed with gratitude that he turns and he comes back and he begins to praise loudly our Lord Jesus Christ. He falls at his feet and he thanks him over and over and over. And Jesus says, weren't there ten? Where are the other nine? Why was this one grateful more than the rest? Maybe it's because he was an outsider. Maybe he didn't have an expectation of healing he didn't just expect this blessing from God. Maybe it was because 
there was something in him that was a little different. That he realized that God had blessed him. He didn't just take it for granted. So many times we take things for granted. When I was in high school, my sister Linda brought home a friend of hers at Thanksgiving. He was a Nigerian student, and the dorms were going to be closed, and so she brought home this student that had never experienced an American Thanksgiving. I remember as we were sitting at the table, he kept asking questions. He asked about the turkey and why we had turkey. He, he asked about the desserts, and we had so many desserts, and he talked about how they did not have such in his country. Everything we did, he asked questions about it. But he seemed grateful more than anything. He kept thanking us. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. And I realized that there may be folks that don't have a place to have Thanksgiving. I just always assumed it would be there. I let, he let me see through his eyes what true gratitude is about. John Wesley, that founder of Methodism, told a story about when he was in college, when he ran across a porter there at Oxford University. Now, a porter at Oxford is someone who is kind of like a groundskeeper and a security guard and a mail deliverer all rolled into one. They do all kinds of things. Wesley met this porter one cold evening, and the porter was dressed in just a thin coat. And Wesley urged him, go home and get a better coat. You're going to freeze tonight. To which the porter replied, I thank God for the one coat that I possess. Wesley then asked him, have you had anything to eat today? To which he replied, I thank God that I had a cup of water. And I am grateful for that. Wesley then, thinking, this guy is kind of strange, grateful for a threadbare coat, grateful just for a cup of water, said, well, what else is there for you to be thankful for? And the porter said, I will thank God for the dry stones to lie upon. I will thank God who has given me being and life and a heart to love and a desire to serve God. Wesley said his life was changed in two ways that night. One was that he was a little bit colder himself, for the porter went home with Wesley's own jacket. The other was that he developed a different attitude, an attitude about the blessings of life that he had taken for granted, and to see this porter who had so little be so grateful. We have all been blessed beyond measure. We can all count our blessings, but instead we often forget. We live in this world of instant gratification. We live in this world of plenty. We eat, and soon we look around for another meal. I remember traveling to Europe one time and going out to a restaurant. They warned me it's going to be about a three-hour event. <laughs> You're not in America anymore. It's not fast food. It's not like going through McDonald's. This is the evening. They're going to bring you several courses, and they're not going to start cooking the food until we order it, and it's going to take quite a while. It was really a great time, though, as we actually stopped and as we savored the meal, as we thought about each course, as we had times between eating to talk to one another and enjoy each other. It slowed me down, at least for that meal. What about you? Do you ever stop? Do you ever slow life down enough to simply be grateful? I wonder how God feels about the blessings that God gives to us over and over and about our attitude. I'm sure it pleases God when we are grateful and thankful. For you know when you give a gift and someone is grateful for it, how it makes you feel. And I'm sure it displeases God when we just assume upon God 
all with the blessings that flow our way. I think I've told you the story before about a friend of mine who's very wealthy. He often gets asked for gifts. He told me this one time. He said, Nelson, uh, people will come to me and they will ask me for a lot of money for this charity or that charity. They assume I might even be the lead giver. And he said, I have one thing I always do. And I said, what is it? He said, whenever they come and ask me for money, no matter how much it is, I write them a check for $100. He said, they usually look pretty disappointed because they're thinking they're going to get several thousand dollars. He said, but I write them a check for $100. And if they send me a thank you note, if they seem grateful, if they tell me what they do with the money and how it helped the organization, he said, within a month, I'll write them a check for $10,000. And if they're grateful for that and use it well, I'll think about even more. I think he's got a pretty good way of doing that. What about us? How do we thank God for all the blessings that we have? Why do we expect God to do more for us if we are not grateful? Scripture is filled with with calls to thank God. First Chronicles 16, 34 says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Psalm 100 says, Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. No wonder Jesus, when this one Samaritan came back to thank him, said, Where are the rest of them? The ones who were taught to be grateful and yet were not. It's all about our attitudes and our actions. This past Wednesday night, Stacy Steck, who's a counselor with CareNet Counseling Centers, came and talked to us about the holidays and about being emotionally healthy through these times that can be so stressful. I found it interesting that Stacy said to us that the number one thing that we can do to have better mental health is to be grateful. It's to simply be grateful. I was grateful for him coming and telling us about that. He gave us a lot of other information. By the way, our Wednesday nights are wonderful. <laughs> If you guys would like to come and join us or join us on Facebook Live, they are some of the best times we have together as a church. I am grateful for them. Gratitude. It truly makes a difference. Harvard studied gratitude not too long ago, and they found that people who were grateful had greater happiness They had more positive emotions. They relished the good experiences. They had improvement in their mental health. They dealt with adversity better, and they built strong relationships. Not to be outdone, the University of California at Davis and the University of Miami went together and did their own study on gratitude. In this study, they divided up the people into three groups. The first group, for 10 weeks, wrote down things they were grateful for. Every day they wrote down things that they were appreciative of in life. The second group wrote down their grievances. (laughs) They wrote down everything that irritated them that day. And the third group simply just wrote down the events of life, nothing positive or negative about them, just what happened. Y'all want to take a guess at which group did the best in life? The grateful group. They were more optimistic. They felt better. They exercised better. They had less illness and trips to the doctor. Another study that was done by the University of Pennsylvania had people write a thank you note to someone they had never thanked before for something that maybe was deep in their heart that they were grateful for, maybe a a teacher from a long time ago, but they had never said these words out loud to them about gratitude. They had them write the thank you note and then go hand deliver it. They gave them a test called a happiness test. Do you know what happened after they hand-delivered the thank you note and retook the test? Their gratitude and their happiness soared. In this study, they found 
that simply doing that note could change an attitude for up to 12 weeks. That's a lot of good out of one note, isn't it? That's how powerful Thanksgiving is. As we talk about our attitudes, I often wonder what our actions might be. This morning, I'm going to challenge us, whether you're in the sanctuary or whether you're at home worshiping online, to do something about this. In just a moment, I'm going to be quiet. And I want to ask you to make a commitment to do something to express your gratitude. I'll give you some ideas. You can make a gratitude list. Simply list out all the things you're grateful for. I mentioned the thank you note. You can write someone a thank you note. You can write God a thank you note. You could keep a gratitude journal each night, simply writing down something that God has given to you that week and you're grateful for. Where is your focus? You could commit to praying this week each day and in your prayers being more grateful. You could do something out of this gratitude. You could give a gift to somebody. You could give a gift because you are grateful for your health and give it to some organization like the American Heart Association, American Cancer Society. You could give a gift because you're grateful to God, to our church or some other ministry. You could give a gift because you're grateful for education, maybe to a school where you went or to a fund for scholarships. Those are just some ideas of what you might do. We're going to be quiet for just a few moments and let you think about that. I hope that as you make a commitment to be grateful during this Thanksgiving week, that you might share that. Give me a call or an email or whatever. Let me know what it is that God has led you to do and that you've done. I'll leave you with a quote I found this week that has become one of my favorites. David Steindl Rast said, It is not joy that makes us grateful. It is gratitude that makes us joyful. Take a moment and think about what God would have you to do and how you might be grateful in this week.